credentials. We've talked to the players, coaches, other re- national pundits, reporters. Uh, we've had you know broadcasters on, but I, I feel like to criticize the players, you have to, there's a fair balance, right? There's an equal balance, but for these players that are not used to, I mean, if they were say in Italy or in Spain or in, in England or in Brazil or Argentina, I mean, they would get hammered from from you know fans and the media. Yeah, and I think you know it's interesting. We talked about it on. ESPN FC, one of the shows, yeah. and we were asking, you know, is this like, is this an evolution? Because people want to say like, oh, it's this is us becoming wiser as a soccer nation now that we have the nuance to understand that we can cheer for these guys in one stadium and boo them in another and, and why that all works. Um, I, I think there is a reality that in this country, um, standards, expectations, pressure, more so than anything else, pressure. That pressure comes from fan intensity and engagement. It comes from the money and investors, you know, what the money, the role that money plays in the game. And if people think that their money is going to be affected, they're much more quick to fire a coach, change a player, make mm-hmm. a trade. You know, right, all right. of those things. There's more money being spent now in the game. There's higher stakes now. We see what we, we never thought we'd miss a World Cup. We see. So now all of these people are agitated in a way that I think. Um, opens us up to criticize more. You're right. These guys, had they lived in any other culture, would know that the obsession, that the yeah. intensity to their work, the detail which, which, with which they are judged. I mean, if you don't run out a ball in like a league game in Uruguay, you get like killed. There's a, there's a <laughs> Sebastian Salazar who plays somewhere in Gonmebol. And if I ever type my name into Twitter, which I will admit to doing after a particular <laughs> broadcast or so, I'll see that, man, they kill this guy, Sebastian Salazar, who plays in, like, U- the Uruguayan second division for, like, not hustling enough. And it's like, <laughs> my gosh, you know, th- this, you don't see that here. We nah. don't talk about that here. That's not the, the way. Now, there's a balance, of course, right? Like, sure. right. There, are, there are other cultures. I can speak to this um, being Mexican-American where like you can almost say the expectations of the Mexican soccer team or the Mexican player are almost too much to the point where they they stifle progress they mm. they choke the players they choke the coaches it's very limiting and it's also not realistic it's not based on the reality of achievements or where your players are playing it's based on the level of obsession with within the country and people say well we love it as much as other places in the world therefore we should be as good as other places in the world um, and unfortunately, the intensity of fandom does not correlate to how well your national team plays. That's just not how it works. So um, we don't want to get to a point where we have a toxic atmosphere, where Mexico's changing coaches. Look at the run-up to the last World Cup four times, yeah. essentially, yeah. in one cycle. That's horrific. And that's born of a culture and an environment that's unhealthily critical. But there's a difference between where we were pre um, October 10th and where Mexico was four years ago. And I think there's a middle ground there where we need to aim for sure. in terms of kind of our atmosphere and, and our, our, our culture of accountability in the soccer sphere in this country. Yeah, abso- a- absolutely, Sebastian. I mean, you talked about it. I mean, uh, Sweden, uh, his uh, family is from Switzerland and my family is from Iran. So we do see that uh, that difference in, in soccer culture. But you did mention uh, – Kind of like how the United States, some people feel like we're in a transition stage. And I think part of that transition stage is also how much interest is going into the U.S. soccer presidency. And today we did see Kyle Martino uh, do a complete uh, 180 and announce that he is going to run for the uh, pres- presidency position. And I think this is a I think this is a big wrinkle um, in terms of that people see Kyle Martino's face uh almost every weekend when the yeah. Premier League uh, does coverage on, on NBC and whatnot. But I did read a tweet that did mention how the more uh, competition comes around, that the more likely it is that Sunil Gulati is going to be uh, reelected. What are your thoughts on Martino uh, starting to uh, announcing his uh, presidency and also uh, the fact that, and also that fact that it might make it easier for Gulati to win if he does uh, end up running again for reelection? I know the tweet you're referencing um, from Steve Goff, and I think that applies generally to elections. As you have right. more mm-hmm. and more candidates flood into an election, the incumbent 
um, tends to, for whatever reason, kind of rise to the top and, and end up winning. I, I guess it, it creates a, a, an atmosphere where all of the contenders kind of contend against each other Correct, uh, as yeah. opposed to kind of, you know, you know, kind of attacking the incumbent. So first off on Kyle Martino, I think we have to uh, acknowledge just how exceptional what he is doing is. This isn't an endorsement because I think it, it would be unfair for um, anybody in the media to endorse any of these guys without really sitting down and knowing a lot more yeah. than we know. A few, a few have done some media work. Um, Eric Ronaldo was on the, the podcast that you guys mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, the Max and Herc podcast. It was a really informative interview. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Martino will do the, the media rounds as well uh, in, in the coming days. We've seen some quotes from Carlos Carrero, who is – um, kind of Sunil Gulati's number two and he's thrown his hat in the race. There's the lawyer contingent, Steve Gans. There's, there's a lot of names um, and, and a lot of different people who we've heard a lot of different things about. But I think um, Kyle joining the race is really exciting for a couple reasons. One is you've got a guy who's willing to put his money where his mouth is. Um, right. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but it is very difficult to have the job that Kyle Martino has um, and has earned through years and years of, of dedicated hard work in the industry that he's in. And that is a job, and this industry is such that you don't step away from your chair. I've done shows where I'm literally like sick as a dog because I don't want to let somebody else sit in my chair and maybe do it better than I do. Sure. And I, I'm sure that Kyle, as confident as he is in his abilities, and he's really, really good at what he does, share some of those similar uh, beliefs just knowing what this industry is like so for him to step away from a job that he does really well that he's really handsomely rewarded for um to pursue something basically for the good of the sport that's i understand given him a lot is really noteworthy and if you know anything or have ever met kyle you know that one he's exceptionally intelligent mm. which is a good thing and I also happen to know this just from a few interpersonal interactions that I've had with him because we've worked on a couple projects together, a couple shows together. Um, I think it comes out very clearly in, I guess, was it the New York Times article earlier yeah. today that kind of mm -hmm. talks about his, his candidacy? Yeah. Is he's a listener. Kyle Martino is not the guy at the dinner table who talks the whole time and tells stories about himself, though he's got great stories. He's a listener. He draws more out of other people at the table. He asks questions. He's engaged with those around him. I think what we've seen and what the critical issues are around U.S. soccer is a lack of diversity, not necessarily in terms of uh, race or age or um, who we are or gender, although I think you could point to some of those as well, but really in terms of where our ideas come from, where the people who make the decisions, where their ideas come come from both on the soccer side and on the business side and so i think having somebody whose goal is not to put their own people in charge and implement their own ideas but to bring the best ideas out of a really melting pot that is u.s soccer is the type of candidate that that we can get behind is Kyle Martino the only person that can do that? No, but I do think, as you mentioned, him being on TV every weekend um, gives him a platform and a name recognition yeah. that'll help his cause. The reality, though, is this isn't a popularity contest. This isn't U.S. soccer fans go to ussoccer.org and vote. Right. This is done very differently, and it's voted on. By a very select group of people. It's like, in many ways, the U.S. presidential election. We all go out and we vote, but <laughs> we don't actually vote, right? Um, right. Yeah. It's not actually us voting. This is different in that we all talk about it, uh, those of us that are interested. And as you say, there's more people interested now because of this um, kind, of, kind of pivotal moment in U.S. soccer history, missing the World Cup. But with all of that said, I think there's still a really small group of people that are really um, focused on this U.S. soccer election. But I, I, I do think it's, it is a testament to, to kind of the, the, the change in the way that we look at this game. We, we, are, we are in some way in that respect definitely evolving.
No, absolutely. I think one thing that struck uh, my 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 attention was that he's all he's always talked about how this NBC gig is his dream job, and that he's he's leaving it uh, to pursue something that's it, it's it's paidless, and it's basically a. It, it, he's basically t- um, wants to improve something that he's been a part of, and now that scene it's it's fallen apart. I mean, you can read his uh, his stuff on 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 his website, which we can, we'll link in the description. But I mean, overall, I mean, Stephen, what, what what do you think? I mean, I think I really like the tone, like you said, Sebastian, of uh, Martino throughout the uh, Mark Stein piece uh, from the New York Times. I think overall, it came off as very professional. It came out that he knew he knew what what he was talking about. And that he has a plan and he's ready to get at it. So, I mean, Stephen, what, what do you think? I find it really interesting because he covers the Premier League, right, with NBC. His gig's the Premier League. He co- you know, he mentions I think when the U.S. didn't qualify, they talked about it. But I find it real interesting that he has, he, he's got his ear tied to what's going on in Europe. So that's a dynamic that you bring as a presidency that I think definitely adds a dimension to his, I guess, credibility. I just have a hard time knowing the difference between all of them. Like, are they really going to really change what Galati has done? You got the 2026 World uh, World Cup bid coming, I guess, with Canada and Mexico and the U.S. joint. Then you have this, I guess, the proposal of 48-team format that could be implemented, could not with FIFA. I, it, it's just so many, you know, it, so much things are happening. And then on the field, you don't have a coach yet. You don't know who's going to replace him. You got a bunch of young players that are waiting to get called up, but Bruce Arena didn't call them up because of the World Cup cycle. Now we're going to that transition. It, it's it's a U.S. soccer is in, I don't know, it's just moving. There's a lot of moving pieces, and nobody really knows how it's going to come together, especially in the next couple of years. Yeah, it is, and I think, but that's that's what makes this a, a really exciting time. We yeah. have kind of a, a potential for tectonic shift at a lot of different levels: at the youth level, at the executive level, at the coaching level. We um, we've never been at a confluence like this, I don't think, in in U.S. soccer history, and 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 that's what makes all of these decisions feel really, really important uh, right now in the present moment. I got to ask you, Sebastian, because. If you had to point to one issue, I, I know it's hard, but if you point to one issue, why do you think U.S. soccer failed to qualify? I think a group of players were very poor. Okay. That 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 really, and I know that I I I, I agree. Kind of beat, I banged that drum really hard when I got back. You know, I, I was in Trinidad. And I didn't really have my wits about me after the game. I think I was in shock, <laughs> kind of like everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> we were pissed. But I, and I've told this, yeah, yeah, not not really pissed, just kind of like stunned and trying yeah. to like thinking all of this big picture mm-hmm. stuff. Like, mm-hmm. what does this mean? Oh, you know, my summer just opened up next summer. I'm not going to Russia <laughs> now. Okay, you know, well, all, all this stuff is floating through your brain. And then um, I get on the flight, and I've, I got five hours to myself. And I land, and I'm starting to see all of the, you know, the response from all the different people. And I don't see a lot of people talking about the game itself. I see a lot of talk, really, just within 24 hours of disappointment of the end of the match. We're talking about Sunil Gulati and the president, and and all of this stuff. And, you know, I I, I was just kind of taken aback that we hadn't really analyzed the 90 minutes where a group of professionals who make really great money. Uh, to, to to play this game, lost to a group of guys that were um, very much not a professional outfit. I mean, that was a Trinidad and Tobago reserve team, right? And that was playing its fourth string goalie, third string. If you give him like an edge, um, there was no reason for those eleven players to come out and lose that game, other than the one off where you're the best team, you play a bad team, and they hit one shot, it goes in, you hit the post three times, and, and their goalie has an incredible match, right? That didn't happen. They showed up dead, yeah. lifeless. They, there was no interest. It was almost as if they thought they'd really, truly, honestly already clinched and that the, the match was a formality. By the time they woke up, it was one nothing. By the time they really got going, it was 2 nothing, And then it was too late. And I think we can point to a lot of things as to why U.S. soccer is not at its best right now 
but that's to that's to turn a blind eye to the progress that has been made over the last 30 years when we went from an international not even also ran but didn't even run to a consistent world cup qualifier that is incredible po- progress over a very short period of time for this country and so to point at the system that that qualified us for seven 